Okay, so till the last lecture, we we were talking about uh, uh, creep deformation, the factors controlling creep, and how the nature of the creep curve is influenced by these uh, different factors, and also uh, how depending upon the mechanism of creep, uh, the creep curve may look different for different mechanisms. So now, uh, since we talked about mechanisms, so in this lecture, we are going to talk about the different mechanisms of creep. Broadly, there are two categories of creep. So, creep deformation which is controlled by diffusion of vacancies or creep deformation which is controlled by dislocation. So, these are broadly the two categories of creep which uh, people have identified till date. So, when we say diffusion of vacancies, so the plastic deformation is controlled by the motion of the vacancies in this particular case and the well known mechanisms uh, under this category are Cobalt creep and navarro herring creep. On the other hand, when we say dislocation based creep mechanisms, the uh, uh, known uh, mechanisms are uh, viscous creep mechanism, then we have also Wiertmann's creep which is also known as power law creep and we also have a variant of this uh, called the Joggett's screw uh, creep mechanism. So, these are some common uh, creep mechanisms which are used to explain plastic deformation uh, through dislocations. Now, um, in the last lecture, we were also talking about how the strain rate of deformation can be described by the following equation. So, we said the strain rate of deformation is a function of the grain size, it is a function of stress and it is a function of temperature and then we introduced all these different parameters such as P, uh, N and Q. So, what we said uh, was P was the grain size exponent, N is the stress exponent and Q is the activation energy of deformation. Now, uh, what can be done is uh, if you know the values of P, N and Q, you will be able to tell which mechanism of creep is actually controlling the deformation process. So, for different values of P, N and Q, so what I might mean to say is uh, for diffusion of vacancies as an example. So, if creep is controlled by the diffusion of vacancies, then you will have a certain set of P, N and Q values and whereas, if it is controlled by uh, different dislocation based mechanisms, then you will have uh, another set of P, N and Q values. So, let me tell you what are the different values of P, N and Q which have been known uh, for these different mechanisms. So, uh, the mechanisms of creep which uh, have been identified so far are listed here. So, you have Nabarro herring creep, you have Cobalt creep, Harper Don creep, grain boundary sliding and you have a viscous glide, dislocation climb, uh, controlled creep and then you have uh, power law breakdown. See these are broadly uh, the different uh, ways in which creep deformation is uh, uh, controlled or basically you can say these are the different rate controlling mechanisms of deformation. Now, very clearly the values of N, P and Q are different for the different mechanisms. For example, for Navarro herring N that is a stress exponent has a value of 1 and P which is the grain size exponent has a value of 2 and Q C which is the activation energy of creep deformation is known to have a value equal to Q L where Q L is lattice diffusion activation energy. Similarly, when we talk of similarly when we talk of Cobalt creep n is again 1, but p has now a different value. So, p is equal to 3 and here the activation energy q c is equal to q g b and q g b is known as the grain boundary diffusion activation energy. So, basically as you go from one type of mechanism to another, these values keep changing. Now, uh, among these, if you see uh, these three mechanisms, Har Narbara Haring, Cobal and Harpo Dawn, all three bear a value of n is equal to 1 and these mechanisms, the n is equal to 1 mechanisms are known as Newtonian creep mechanisms. So, Navarro Haring, Cobal and Harpo Dawn creep are known as the Newtonian creep mechanisms. So, why are they known as the Newtonian creep mechanisms? Well, uh, that is because of the following thing. So, the Newtonian 
fluids. So, uh, Newtonian fluids are those where the viscous stresses act arising from their flow are linearly proportional to the local strain rate. So, essentially what this means is the local strain rate of deformation in Newtonian fluids is directly proportional to the applied stress. And if you see there is a similarity between this equation and the equation of creep when n is equal to 1. So, when n is equal to 1 you can see that the strain rate of deformation or the creep rate of deformation is going to be directly dependent on the value of sigma. So, that is why all those cases where n is equal to 1 where there is a direct dependence linear dependence of epsilon dot on sigma those are known as the Newtonian creep mechanisms or the Newtonian viscous creep mechanisms. So, uh, from here on uh, for the next uh, few minutes or uh, uh, we are going to talk more about the Newtonian viscous creep mechanisms. So, we will go into the details of Harper Don, uh, we are going to go into the details of Nabarro Herring creep, Kobel creep and Harper Don creep. So, first let us talk about Nabarro Herring and Kobel creep. So, uh, the reason I am, uh, so between Nabarro Herring, Kobel and Harper Don there are some subtle differences. But the main difference between Nabarro Herring, Kobel and Harper Don is that Nabarro Herring and Kobel creep are known as diffusion creep mechanisms. That means, the creep deformation is controlled by the diffusion of vacancies. Whereas, Harper Don, although there are a lot of points of view about Harper Don, but by and large I think one thing that has been agreed upon is that Harper Don is considered to be a dislocation based creep mechanism. So, we are going to talk more about Harper Don creep in the coming slides, but right now I am going to focus about Nabarro Herring and Kobel creep. So, now Nabarro Herring and Kobel creep diffusion creep based mechanisms and the main difference between these two is that the grain size exponent p is equal to 2 for a Nabarro Herring and it is 3 for Kobel creep and for Nabarro Herring the activation energy of deformation creep deformation q is equal to q l whereas it is q is equal to q g b for Kobel creep. So, Nabarro Herring creep was uh, identified by Nabarro in the year 1948 and uh, independently by Herring in the year 1950 that is why this mechanism of deformation has been named against these uh, two gentlemen. So, it is known uh, as Nabarro Herring whereas, Kobel was uh, identified by uh, R L Kobel in the year uh, 1963. So, the references are mentioned here. So, what happens in Nabarro Herring creep and what happens in Kobel creep? So, we are talking about diffusion of vacancies. So, what a how exactly or what exactly happens during diffusion? So, what has been observed is when a stress is applied. So, creep for creep you need stress, you need temperature. So, when you apply a stress under certain conditions combinations of stress and temperature, what has been observed is there is diffusion of vacancies from grain boundaries perpendicular to the applied stress to the grain boundaries parallel to the applied stress throughout the lattice. So, in Nabarro Herring creep what is happening is there is some form of diffusion of vacancies and this diffusion of vacancies are happening from grain, grain boundaries which are perpendicular to the applied stress to grain boundaries which are parallel to the applied stress and the diffusion takes place through the lattice through the bulk of the crystal. Whereas, in Kobel creep, so what happens in Kobel creep is when a stress is applied again for certain combinations of stress and temperatures when a stress is applied what happens is again there is diffusion of vacancies, but here the diffusion of vacancies from grain boundaries perpendicular to applied stress to grain boundaries parallel to the applied stress actually happens through the grain boundaries. Instead of diffusion happening through the lattice in the case of Kobel creep the diffusion of vacancies happens through the grain boundaries. So, that is how Nabarro Herring and Kobel creep are different from each other. So, in this picture I am giving you an illustration of uh, the mechanism. So, Nabarro Herring, so you have a stress sigma and this is grain boundary which is perpendicular to the applied stress, another grain boundary which is perpendicular to the applied stress and these two these grain boundaries uh, can be assumed to be more or less parallel to the applied stress. So, what happens is when you are um, applying a stress, so there is excess of vacancies which is generated at the grain boundaries perpendicular to the applied stress. So, there is more amount of vacancies here and less amount of vacancies on the grain boundaries which are parallel to the applied stress. 
So, vacancies are going to move from the grain boundaries perpendicular to the applied stress to the grain boundaries parallel to the applied stress. So, you have diffusion of vacancies like that. So, vacancies are moving from grain boundaries perpendicular to grain boundaries parallel. If you see in this picture, the blue arrows actually show motion from here to here and that is because that is the direction in which atoms are going to move. So, when you say vacancies are moving, the opposite of it is atoms are moving in the opposite direction. So, the atoms move in a direction opposite to the motion of vacancies. So, because there is atoms moving from the grain boundaries parallel to the applied stress to the grain boundaries perpendicular to the applied stress. So, what eventually happens is that you have an extension of the grain. So, if you see the dotted line actually indicates the change in the grain length. So, the grains tend to elongate along the direction of the applied stress. Now, let us look at the case of cobal creep. So, in cobal creep again you have a stress which is applied perpendicular to the grain boundaries. So, all those grain boundaries which are perpendicular to the applied stress are going to have an excess of vacancies and the grain boundaries which are parallel to the applied stress are going to have a uh, lower concentration of vacancies. So, again there is a vacancy concentration gradient. So, vacancies are going to move in this direction and in this case the vacancies actually uh, sorry. So, the vacancies actually do not move along the bulk, but they prefer to move along the grain boundaries. So, in comparison to Navarro herring where the vacancy diffusion is through the bulk of the grain in cobal, cobal creep the uh, idea is that the vacancies tend to go along the grain boundaries. So, these are the grain boundaries. So, they, the vacancies consider the grain boundaries as a easier path to by which they can travel. So, again the same thing the blue arrows indicate the direction of motion of the atoms. So, the atoms move from parallel grain boundaries to the perpendicular grain boundaries. So, again just like in Navarro herring creep the there is going to be a shape change in the shape of the grain. So, the grains are going to get deformed because of the process and so they are going to get elongated. So, this is basically an overview of what is exactly happening in Navarro herring creep and what is happening in cobal creep uh, mechanism. So, the strain rate of deformation. So, Navarro and Navarro herring have developed equations to explain how creep happens uh, by the mechanism that they identified. So, that is what we are going to talk uh, from here on. So, we are going to talk about the derivation of the Navarro herring creep equation. So, since there is a stress present and there is also diffusion happening. So, the creep basically happens here in the case of Navarro herring creep. The creep happens by the stress assisted diffusional mass transport. So, mass in the sense atoms are moving from one grain boundary to another. So, there is diffusion. So, it is basically assisted by stress. So, this is called stress assisted diffusional mass transport. Now, like I showed in the diagram, the diffusion in vacancies or the motion of atoms from one grain boundary to another is leading to a crystal strain, which in turn contributes to the deformation of the grains and consequently the material. So, in the previous diagram, so here I showed how the grains are getting elongated. So, basically the diffusion of vacancies or the motion of atoms from one grain boundary to another leads to a crystal strain. So, there is a deformed plastic strain that is getting introduced in the process and this crystal strain turn in turn contributes to deformation of the grains and consequently uh, globally at local level if you, you can think of deformation of crystal, but when several such crystals are getting deformed at a globally it is also deforming your material. So, Navarro herring developed equations to determine the strain rate of deformation happening by this mechanism. So, when they developed these equations the assumptions they made were as follows. The first assumption is that the grain boundaries are perfect sources and sinks of vacancies. So, uh, the reason is if the grain boundaries they have considered the grain boundaries are perfect sources and sinks of vacancies. If the grain boundaries are not perfect sources and sinks of vacancies, then it will be difficult for deformation to happen by grain boundaries releasing the vacancies. So, basically what I am trying to say here is if the grain boundaries are not perfect sources, then you may have to apply a stress higher uh, 
then a certain level for to create an excess of vacancies at the grain boundaries. But on the other hand, if you look at them as perfect sources and sinks of vacancies, so you are saying just by the application of even a tiny load, you are able to initiate uh, excess vacancies or create excess vacancies and so it is easier just in the presence of a small stress for the uh, diffusion process to start at a high temperature. So, that is the first thing. So, the grain boundaries can release vacancies easily as well as absorb vacancies easily. If that does not happen, then there is going to be either a stress threshold stress that needs to be overcome uh, to for the process to start and again if they do not absorb vacancies easily, then also the mechanism of creep is not going to operate. So, that is the first assumption. Now, the second assumption is that the initial dislocation density of the crystal is very low. So, Nabarro Haring also assume that the dislocation density of the crystal has to be low. The reason is we want the plastic deformation to happen only by diffusion of vacancies, but if the material has a surplus of dislocations, if the dislocation density is high, then what would happen is the dislocations will invariably start contributing to the plastic deformation process and hence then the deformation is not entirely by diffusion of vacancies, it will also have a component of deformation coming from the dislocations motion and thus the derivation of the Nabarro herring creep will then become com complicated. So, the strain rate of deformation in that case will not be straightforward uh, and it will become complicated that is why they are assumed Nabarro and herring assumed that the initial dislocation density of the crystal should be low. Okay. So, with these two assumptions uh, they started deriving the equation. So, now I am going to derive the equation. So, we said you have a grain boundary you have a grain and you are going to apply a stress sigma. So, the grain boundaries which are perpendicular to the applied stress are going to develop more vacancies. So, the concentration of the vacancies in these grain boundaries which are perpendicular to the applied stress is going to be higher than the grain boundaries which are parallel to the applied stress. That is because as you apply a stress you are basically forcing you are stretching the bond. So, you are going to create more space. So, it that is a very simplistic way of looking at it, but you are applying a stress and you are stretching you are basically creating more gap. So, that is why the grain boundaries which are uh, perpendicular to the applied stress will have an excess of vacancies. Whereas, the grain boundaries which are per, uh, under compression. So, this is basically these grain boundaries can be called under tension and say let us say these grain boundaries are going to be under compression because when you are trying to stretch something then automatically on the other the other faces will try to compress. So, naturally you are going to have compression on these a compressive stress state on these grain boundaries. So, what happens is now because of this the grain boundaries which are perpendicular to the stress or which are under tension are going to have an excess of vacancies or surplus vacancies compared to the grain boundaries which are under compression. So, this creates a concentration of gradient of vacancies. Now, as a function of stress, so here for the creep to happen you need both stress and temperature and what we know is generally the concentration of vacancies at a given temperature e is equal to e to the power minus q f over k t. So, that is the concentration of vacancies fraction uh, as a function of temperature and so, this is the role of temperature. So, at every temperature you will have an equilibrium concentration of vacancies. Now, when you have an applied stress combining, so if you if you define this as C V due to only temperature, this is what you will get. Now, when you have a stress superimposed on this, so you are contributing uh, vacancies also because of the application of a stress. Then the grain boundaries which are in tension will have vacancy concentration given by the following equation. So, Q f is the activation energy for formation of vacancies and sigma omega 
is uh, sigma is the applied stress and omega is the atomic volume. So, the uh, uh, sigma into omega basically gives you an energy term. So, what it basically this equation says is when you have applied when you have applied a stress you are basically providing energy for the creation of vacancies especially in, in because of the tension because under because these grain boundaries are under, under tension. Now, let us look at the other case when the grain boundaries are in compression. So, your concentration of vacancies is going down come, going to come down. So, here you are creating more vacancies vacancies greater than what you have because of the temperature effect and when the grain boundaries are in compression C V compression you have you are going to have a reduction in the vacancy concentration. So, you have e to the power minus sigma omega by k t. So, clearly you have higher concentration of vacancies here and lower concentration of vacancies here. So, you have a concentration gradient. So, you have delta C V and because the dislocation uh, the vacancies are moving from tension to compression. So, the diffusion path is from uh, the uh, from tension to compression. So, you can say the vacancy concentration is C V the gradient is C V compression minus C V tension. So, that will be so delta C V will be e to the power minus q f over k t. If you take it out common then you will have minus sigma omega over k t minus e to the power sigma over over k t. So, that is what you will end up with delta C v represented by e to the power minus q f over k t and e to the power minus sigma omega by k t minus e to the power sigma omega by k t. Now, the flux that is uh, now, because there is diffusion happening, so there is a flux that is created and by fixed law, fixed first law, we know j is equal to minus d d c by d x. So, that is fixed first law and d is the diffusivity and so, if you look, go by this equation, you will have minus d and d c is basically the concentration gradient. So, that is delta C V. So, that becomes e to the power minus q f over k t to e to the power minus sigma omega over k t minus by d x. So, d x is basically the diffusion distance and in the case of this grain with a grain size d, d x can be approximated as d. So, it is it will be going to be some constant of d constant times d, but we can approximate it as uh, approximately as the grain size. So, d is the grain size. So, j then becomes. So, because this is diffusion of vacancy, so let us call it d v and so this basically becomes d v e to the power minus q f over k t into e to the power sigma omega over k t minus e to the power minus sigma omega over k t by d. So, that is what the flux will be equal to. Now, when sigma omega is very small compared to k t. So, if you have a condition like that when sigma omega is very small compared to k t then we know e to the power sigma omega over k t will be equal to sigma omega over k t. So, when the exponential term is small then the exponent the e to the power x is if x is very small then e to the power x is basically x. So, here e to the power sigma omega by k t becomes sigma omega over k t. So, with what that means is you can expand this saying it is d v e to the power minus q f over k t into 2 sigma omega 
by k t over d. So, this is what j is equal to. Now, <coughs> so just to give you an example of cases where sigma omega is going to be smaller than k t. So, if your applied stress sigma is in the range of 1 to 50 MPa and uh, if your atomic volume is 10 to the power minus 29, then in cases like this you will see K T at high temperatures, K T at high temperatures will be equal to some somewhere in the range of 10 to the power minus 20 joule. So, you will see this number is significantly larger than the product of sigma and omega and in cases like this your sigma omega is going to be smaller than K T. So, you will have you end up with this particular form of the equation. So, J is equal to, so if you expand d v, so basically the expansion of d v will be some constant d naught and it is going to be e to the power minus q m over k t. So, d is equal to d naught into e to the power minus q m over k t. So, q m is the activation energy for migration of the vacancies. So, there are two aspects here, the first aspect was q f which is the activation energy for the formation of vacancies and the second thing activation energy is q m which is the activation energy for the migration of the vacancies. So, j is equal to d naught e to the power minus q m by k t into 2 sigma omega over d k t. So, that is what into yeah. So, uh, and then there is a term e to the power minus q f over k t. So, that becomes equal to d naught e to the power minus q m plus q f over k t into 2 sigma omega over d into k times t. So, that is what the, the, the flux diffusion flux ends up as. Now, if you want to, so because there is some mass transport happening and accordingly there is a change in um, uh, shape of the crystal. So, the amount of material that is flowing from one grain boundary to another to determine that you basically have to, you can talk about it in terms of rate of change of volume and that will be equal to the flux into the area. So, the units, so uh, j into d square. So, if you, so if we say it is d v over d t, so that becomes d naught into e to the power minus q m plus q f over k t into 2 sigma omega by d k t into d square. So, that is what will be the rate of change of volume and since its rate of change of volume can be converted into rate of change of length. So, you can convert rate of change of volume to rate of change of length by doing this. So, 1 over d square into d v over d t that will be the rate of change of length. Let us call this some delta d over delta t. So, that becomes equal to 1 by d square into d v over d t and so the rate of change of strain. So, the rate of strain is going to be 1 over d into delta d by delta t. So, that becomes 1 over d into 1 over d square into delta d v by d t which is d naught e to the power minus q m plus q f by k t into 2 sigma omega by d k t into d square. So, you have d square d square cancelling each other and you have a d and d product. So, the rate of change of strain which is basically strain rate is ends up as d naught e to the power minus q m plus q v over k t into 2 sigma omega by d square k t. So, this is basically the derivation of Nabarro Herring creep 
So, the thing to be noted is when you have q m plus q v uh, q f. So, you have q m plus q f this can be taken as equal to q l. So, q l is basically the activation energy required for the vacancies to move through for the uh, Nabarro herring creep to happen. So, q l is the lattice diffusivity and it is equivalent to the activation energy required for Nabarro herring creep to happen. So, q m plus q l is equal q f is equal to q l. So, so, uh, so if we if this equation epsilon dot is equal to d naught and this equation can eventually be written as epsilon dot for Nabarro herring is equal to a n h approximately equal to a n h and d lattice d l. So, d l is basically d naught lattice into e to the power minus q l over k t. So, it is d l by d square into sigma omega over k t. So, epsilon dot n h is equal to a n h into d l by d square into sigma omega by k t. So, d l is equal to the lattice diffusivity. So, that is the derivation of the equation for uh, Navarro herring creep deformation. So, a similar equation has been developed for uh, cobalt creep. So, the difference between so the strain rate of deformation by cobalt creep is given by AC over pi into d g b over d cube into delta the grain boundary into sigma omega over k t. So, this is the equation for cobalt creep. So, you have AC over pi d g b by d cube. So, d g b is grain boundary diffusivity d g b is grain boundary diffusivity and delta g b delta g b is grain boundary thickness. So, d g b the expansion of d g b is d g b is equal to d naught g b e to the power minus q g b over k t. So, the activation energy required for cobalt creep is basically equal to the grain boundary diffusion activation energy whereas, the activation energy required for Nabarro herring is lattice diffusion activation energy. So, these are basically the two equations one for Nabarro herring and one for cobalt. Now, if you see cobalt creep from the previous equation is proportional to 1 over d cube and Nabarro herring is proportional to 1 over d square. So, clearly cobalt creep is more sensitive to grain size changes than Nabarro herring. So, what happens is as the grain size continues to reduce. So, if you have a material with a finer grain size because the number of grain boundaries increases. So, why is it sensitive to d cube that is because when you reduce the grain size you are introducing more and more grain boundaries into the material. So, that is why cobalt creep is going to become more and more prominent because cobalt creep requires diffusion of vacancies through the grain boundaries. So, as you refine the grain size you are introducing more grain boundaries into the material. So, naturally cobalt creep tends to become more prominent. So, at, at a certain grain size a critical grain size cobalt creep will eventually become dominant over the Nabarro herring creep. And what we are also seeing is that the strain rate of deformation is more sensitive to grain size in cobalt creep than it is in Navarro herring creep. Now, between uh, cobalt creep and Navarro herring creep one key difference is if your test is being carried out at lower temperatures then cobalt creep will be the favored mechanism of creep. So, low temperatures between Navarro herring and cobalt creep at lower temperatures cobalt creep will be more favored and at higher temperatures Navarro herring creep will be more favored. So, the reason is the activation energy for vacancy diffusion within the lattice that is q l is greater than the activation energy required for diffusion along the grain boundaries. 
So, Q L is greater than Q G B. So, what happens is as you go down in temperature lattice diffusion is slowly going to come down. So, for the vacant as you go down in temperature the vacancies will find it difficult to go through the lattice compared to the more open structure available in the grain boundary. So, you are talking about diffusion of vacancies and the diffusion of vacancies can happen through the lattice or they can happen through the grain boundary. Now, the grain boundary has a more open structure compared to the lattice. So, when the temperature is low that means, the energy that you are, that you are providing through temperature is not high enough then the vacancies would rather prefer to go through a open structure like the grain boundary than go through a more ordered structure like the lattice. That is why at low temperatures cobal creep going to be dominant at low temperatures. So, another way of also looking at the same point is the strain rate is proportional to e to the power q minus over k t. So, when t is low, so when t is low k t is small. So, if you have when t is small uh, t is low and k t is small if you have q the activation energy is equal to q l then the strain rate is going to come down. If q is equal to q l then the strain rate is smaller compared to q is equal to q g b. So, the point is if t is small k t is small and if q is larger then the overall I, overall term in the exponent is also going to be larger. So, it is a it has a negative point. So, it is minus q over k t. So, if q is large then minus q over k t is also going to be large which means the strain rate is going to be low. So, in such a case you would rather prefer q to be equal to q g b rather than q is equal to q l. So, that is why if q is equal to q g b at lower temperatures then you will have a higher strain rate of deformation achieved with cobol than with Nabarro herring. So, that is the reason behind this.